Welcome, everybody. This is Two Ed Tech Guys. Take questions and share cool stuff. And Richard and I just love to hang out and try answering your questions. Y'all send us a bunch of good ones, and uh, we've, we've got a pretty, pretty sizable crop this week as well, do we not? We do. We do. Some from some leftovers from last week, and a whole bunch of new ones too. You know, turns out people have questions. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting for the questions to start shifting from, so I've got this issue with Google Classroom to I've got this issue with my, with my cousin who's got some <laughs> psychological thing or whatever, right? You know, so, so whatever it might be. But you know, uh, I, so just thought, I just thought, Rustin, since Alex Trebek passed away over, over the weekend, we should have had everyone submit their questions in the form of an answer. <laughs> There's a thought. Uh, we'll, we'll put that on the list for, for possible ways of honoring Mr. Trebek going forward. May he rest in peace. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us. We love getting the chance to talk to you about all sorts of stuff, and we want to send out some very specific thanks. Um, and that goes to all of the, the good folks at the Krauss Center for Innovation in Los Altos Hills, California, who, uh, who are the, the people responsible for Merit and, and the cool program that that is. Uh, all of the good folks from Long Island University who are in the EdTech Master's program with Betty and Mike and, and all of those good folks. And of course, Richard, give us the explanation on this one. FreeTechForTeachers.com, a little blog I started 13 years ago this month. And I just keep blogging away, writing about cool things that I find in the EdTech space. Excellent. Now, uh, my little shindig is Next Vista for Learning. It's an online library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a student audience, all screen content. My own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance, one creative video at a time. Ding. All right, so with that. All right, uh, you're gonna find videos in, on, on the site about academic stuff and communities and service to others and learning English and careers and advice for teens and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and if you check in with us next week, you can get another episode of Activities Across Grade Levels. We're going to talk about some really cool accessibility stuff, uh, particularly uh, in this case for the, the visually impaired. We have got a dynamo of a guest joining us <clears throat> from, uh, from Utah who knows lots about lots in that, in that space, and she's just a whole lot of energy. Hope you will join us. There is no episode today. We've shifted to first and third Thursdays on that, which is not an easy thing to say multiple times in a row quickly. <laughs> How's this all going to work today? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to like jump into some questions and then share cool stuff, just like the title. Richard, get us going. What's the first question? All right. First question of the day. We've got one here from Michelle, who says, I have this one's all you, Rustin. I have a page of 12 rubrics I've created to grade essays. I put that many on a page to save paper. All about saving paper. But then I needed to send those rubrics to the students. The only way I could think to do it was to use a SNP tool and email the individual SNPs to each student. Can you or Richard suggest a quicker, easier method? And Rushton, you and Michelle went back and forth to get some more information. And uh, what'd, you, what'd you come up with? I, I did indeed. Um, one, one of the challenges here is that Michelle is visually impaired. All right, so she is, she's working on getting things together in a way that works both for her and for her students. And so um, the, the thing that I pointed her to, and, and this is where we are in the conversation at the moment, is the idea of just using Google Classroom. Now you've got screen reader possibilities, things like this, right? Uh, but, but in the assignment, go ahead and, and include like a, uh, uh, a document that is the rubric. And then you know, when, when you have the, the piece that is the essay that they're gonna write through, right? that's gonna be one where each student gets a copy. And so it, after you grade them in Classroom, you can then paste paste the comments in uh, from whatever you've been gathering them in, uh, and that that will then be in classroom both the, the grade and your comments as a record. And so even if you're you're doing your grades in another system, uh, that would be a lovely way to be able to track everything that you've done up to that point. Uh, and so so I, I think that might be a, a better overall solution going forward. But I I am open to the idea that there are things that I don't fully understand that she might say you know there's this. And then we'll, we'll factor that in as we go. Keep it going, Richard. What's the next one? Next one came from Stephanie, who says, I apologize if you've covered this already, but I'm looking for an extension or add-on for Google Classroom to take attendance. I'm scrambling to get an accurate attendance each time we meet. 
would love to not have to stop and do a roll call. If you could show my students in alphabetical order by a last name, this would be so much easier. However, it only does it by first name. Let me know if you have any suggestions. Well, I had a suggestion of a Chrome extension called Meet Attendance offered by claycodes.org. There are mixed reviews about it. Uh, one of the caveats to using it is that it has been known to interfere with some of the other features of Google Meet. So if there's some features of Google Meet that you really need or like to use, it may not be the option for you, but it's worth trying. Uh, you know, the great thing about Chrome extensions is you can install them and give them a try. And if it doesn't work, well, just uninstall it and forget you ever used it. Uh, so that was one, one option. And Rustin, you had a suggestion, if your school hasn't turned it off, have students rename themselves upon entering uh, so that yeah. it's a little bit easier that way. Yeah, this, this one is a Zoom suggestion, right? And so uh, on the assumption that you're using Zoom, uh, students, by the, the, very, the initial default is that students can rename themselves uh, in an environment where students may not be uh, prone to the best behavior, shall we say, uh, that could be problematic. And for that reason, there are schools that have turned off the ability for students to rename themselves. If your school has not, however, then by having them rename themselves last name, comma, first name, uh, you might be able to see things quite quickly. Remember that the order that you see them is not merely alphabetical. Uh, according to whatever it might be using, first name, last name. It's also uh, a function of who's muted and who's not. So if everybody is, is say, muted with their camera on, as in they all have the same kind of arrangement, then you will get it alphabetically, and that would be uh, a way to handle it. Now, do also know that if you can get into the web uh, dashboard for Zoom, you can get information about who was in the meeting and when, Right, so you know, from time X to time Y, which which can be really useful. That's extra work, but if you need it, you got it. Yeah, let's do another. Let's do another question, and then and then hit some hit some share. All right, this one comes from Katarina, and we get a we get questions like this one fairly often. It is, uh, do you have a video on how to have the picture of the teacher in the bubble or other shape while using the screen to teach an activity? I watched a video, but I and I really, sorry, I watched a video on Twitter, but I couldn't find it on YouTube. I thought it was a really great feature, and I, uh, so yes. Long story short, looking to make a screencast video with your head floating around in it somewhere. Lots of tools for that. Screencastify does it. I like Loom as an option. My favorite tool of all of them is Screencast-O-Matic. I have it installed on my desktop costs about 20 bucks a year to use it. Love it. Uh, but all three of those will give you the ability to have your kind of your webcam view on your screencast video to show anything on your screen. Flipgrid even has that option now. So you can do it Flipgrid if you're already using Flipgrid. I will point this out. Uh, this question has come up a lot this year, which is good. Uh, there's a lot of people making videos and a lot of people are recognizing that having your face in the video is a good thing. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that students will pay attention a little bit longer if they can see your face as opposed to not seeing your face. And as Chris Brogan told me years ago when I was starting to make videos, he said, just get over yourself. Don't worry about how good or bad you look. Just get your face on the camera. People want to see your face and connect with it. And really, that's pretty good advice. Like, that, that is good advice. It, it, it speaks to the, the importance of, of the subtle things with regard to rapport with students, right? You know, if, if you are a teacher who smiles more, you have fewer behavioral problems than, than teachers who don't. Just, just all things being equal, that's just generally the case, right? Uh, and, and so the same thing goes, right? Now, who is this person that's talking to me? And you know, oh, well, it's that, that person and she looks happy or, or whatever it might be. All of that stuff matters when, when you're thinking about this kind of thing. And speaking of things that matter, let's move to music. Yeah, so this is a cool thing. I was writing, uh, I was writing a blog post today about rolling with the changes. That blog post will be out later this week, uh, which led me to looking for REO Speedwagon videos on YouTube. 
which led me to this video of Tommy Shaw, who was the front man for Styx, mm -hmm. the greatest band ever, uh, performing with the Cleveland Youth Orchestra. And it was just such an odd pairing. Like I would never think to put Styx and the Cleveland Youth Orchestra together. It's just really, really cool music. Uh, a really cool thing with kids working with a rock star, admittedly an over the hill aging rock star, but still, <laughs> he's 67. I, I had to Google it. Tommy Shaw is 67 years old now. Um, you know, sorry to anyone who's also 67 <laughs> who's now watching our <laughs> webinar. No kidding, Harry. <laughs> uh, I just alienated half our audience. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but really, really cool, really cool video. Uh, I, I love music. Fun fact about me. I briefly considered majoring in tuba performance. Then I realized the job prospects for that were even lower than they were for people who had degrees in history and political science. So, yeah. So, so I would contend, by the way, that that all of our viewers who are in that age range are probably like Tommy Shaw in this video, aging well. That that is that is my guess on that front because you know if if you are if you are uh, a little older shall we say and you're like show me some cool tech the chances are really good that that you are uh, you are the kind of kind of person that people are like that's awesome um, so so there and, and, and to try to redeem myself a little bit uh, on my comment there I have seen sticks and Ario Speedwagon in concert. Were they in concert together? They were not, but I do have that album from 2000 when they performed in St. Louis together. Wow. I, I have seen Chicago and Earth, Wind and Fire together like multiple times. And, and that, that was pretty darn amazing. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, oh, Sheila said, I thought you were gonna say we were all rock stars. That is also true. <laughs> Speaking of things that rock, I believe we uh, we established last week that Thanksgiving is like a favorite holiday for both of us. It is. And StoryCorps has their annual great Thanksgiving listen coming up. Well, it's now. It's happening now, actually. And this is a cool project because it, involved, it gets parents involved in the classroom with kids or it could get parents involved, or it could get grandparents involved, or aunts or uncles. The idea is that students, or anyone else for that matter, record short audio interviews, short oral histories about family and family traditions and community traditions, and you, know, you can share it on the StoryCorps website. And StoryCorps has some great lesson plans to go along with it. I, I like that the uh, captioning tool got your version of community traditions down to gummy traditions, which itself is probably something that's significant in some cultures. <laughs> yes, that's my, that's my guess. All right. Yeah, we actually talked about uh, this particular um, resource on the celebrating holidays episode of activities across grade levels last week. And, and in doing that, right, that, that was huge fun, by the way, Susan Stewart's amazing. Uh, but, but in talking about this, it, we, we really got into the weeds talking about, okay, well, what, what does it mean like for students to be learning to interview someone, to, to work to get a good story out of someone else? To, you know, how do you prompt that? And so you know, when you look at, at the great Thanksgiving listen, this is a fantastic tool for helping kids develop you know, a sense of confidence and a sense of uh, uh, you know, how to tell a story compellingly. I mean, it's just this, this is a cool one for very sure. So not, not kudos uh, for, for this particular share. Uh, love it, love it, love it. Which, uh, which raises the question, what's the next question? Well, before we get to the next question, I got to say that in the chat, anyone who's not here for the live session is missing out on some great concerts that are going back and <laughs> forth in the chat right now. There, uh, Everyone is sharing all kinds of interesting uh, things there. So let's get into the next question now. Uh, all right. Where were we? Where were we? Where were we? Um, uh, okay. So uh, I'm trying to cut, I'm going to cut down on it. As you know, distance learning has brought many challenges to teachers. One of the biggest challenges we face is being able to assess students accurately without having doubts if they're searching for answers on their phones, iPads, computers. What sites do you recommend for assessing students' knowledge? We currently use uh, Socrative, but I'm hoping you might have other suggestions. 
suggestions, uh, says Mark. So I wrote back to Mark because we talked about a similar question a couple of weeks ago in this webinar. And you know, I gave the example of one of the things that I'm doing is changing the type of quiz question or the type of uh, assessment activity that I'm doing. You know, it's a lot easier. Believe me, it's a lot easier to have kids in class and give them a multiple choice quiz than it is to do what I'm doing now, which is rewriting the assessment to be much more summative, much more problem solving where uh, students have to solve a scenario. So for example, one of the questions I rewrote just last week was a question about what type of cable do you use when connecting a switch and a router in a wired network? The answer, by the way, uh, is very, very Googleable. Okay. I rephrase that to say, the school librarian is called, half of the computers in the computer lab are no longer accessing the internet after a student moved one of the computers to retrieve some papers that are behind it. What are, what's the process you're gonna go through to, to talk the librarian through the process of getting those computers back on the internet? So that got in, that gets into the troubleshooting, it gets into the cabling, that gets into a whole bunch of things. It's gonna take me a heck of a lot longer to read through those responses and grade those responses than a Google form that says, yes, you got it, no, you didn't get it. But I think it's much more meaningful. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if you if you look at fact recall as having like this much value, you've got to do a load of fact recall questions to to think that you're getting to a point where you're having this much value and one or two really good. How do you think about this questions may already be here in terms of value. Right. Um, yeah. I will say, though, that in the space of trying to find good ways uh, to to follow what people are, are, are doing with their answers. One of, one of the issues with uh, Google Classroom is that when you're you're assessing work, if you've got multiple questions on a thing that you're having students answer, you have to you still have to go from student to student to student to student, right? Um, formative uh, at GoFormative.com actually is is a tool that is much more organized about how you go through the answers that are provided and how you can efficiently move comments around. Uh, and so that is that is an option that might be good for you. Uh, if you are looking, e e even if you're not looking to raise your game with regard to the, the academic quality of the question, uh, that was a loaded thing to say. Sorry, you know, I bow in your direction. Nevertheless, um, it might be a tool that you want to take a look at. Let's go on to another question. Uh, and to the, to the extent of go forward, I do have a little video about, uh, about how to use it. So put that in the chat for anyone who wants to check it out. And I'm doing a webinar that includes that next week. So check that out as well. All right, uh, other questions that we have, we've got so many questions. Um, so uh, there seems to be so many virtual whiteboard tools out there right now. And I know that you have highlighted many of them. Would it be possible to have a comparison done? I would love to know some of the pros and cons for each of the tools to know which tool is best to meet different needs. So, I am working on that actually. I'm working on writing up a comparison of a whole bunch of these tools and putting them in a chart and doing a pros and cons list for all of them. That said, here's what it comes down to for me. Uh, if you're in a G Suite for education or Google Workspaces for education uh, setting, Jamboard is my go-to because with Jamboard, I can have multiple pages. So it's kind of like uh, you know ripping off paper from the big paper easel and then going on the next page. And when I'm done, anything I've drawn on the Jamboard, I can share with all my students in Google Classroom and give them all a copy of it. So I like that. If I'm using Microsoft Teams, I like the idea of drawing on a blank OneNote page and then sharing that with my students when we're done. So those are my kind of go-to options right now. There's others out there, uh, you know, if you're working with younger kids and you just want to see them drawing on a screen, uh, Whiteboard Fi is a good option uh, where they can, they don't need a username and a password, you know, with Jamboard or with you know, using Microsoft Teams and OneNote, the kids are going to log into things. Uh, but Whiteboard Fi is a nice option if you don't want kids to log in. But uh, I am working on that. 
Yeah. Cool. So, so quick look at Whiteboard Phi. Uh, you can get to Jamboard via Google Drive, right? And so you're right. in Drive, you know, new or create or whatever it is, and then go in and more, and you'll see Jamboard there. And whiteboard.fi is is mm -hmm. is a particularly good uh, option for those who are like, nope, not using Google. I, all right, fine. Um, here's here's a good one. So all good there. All right, let's take a look at the next cool thing to share before we do a last uh, question or two or three and, uh, and before we finish today. So this month, I am spending a lot of energy on, on highlighting amazingly cool organizations. Now, there are plenty of cool organizations out there, but, I, but I'm looking for the amazingly cool organizations. And so we talked about Cake for Kids last week. Really, really good thing. Um, this week, I want to talk about Magic Wheelchair. So Magic Wheelchair is an organization that, uh, that I mean, the, the story, the story is beautiful. So on this slide, and you can get to the slides, I will email you, you can get back to our, 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 our page with all of the archives of, of, of our webinars on it. Um, and, and just get to the thing where it's like, all right, here, boom, you know, like, uh, uh, here are the slides, here are the links, all of that kind of thing. So magic wheelchair. Um, what this is, is I want you to imagine Halloween for a minute. We passed Halloween. What I'm talking about is being grateful for people who, who make a difference in the lives of others. Oh, gotcha. Good. So, so, so what that is, is at Halloween, you can imagine the kid who's in a wheelchair saying, I want to be a pirate. And, you know, the wheelchairs are kind of in the way of, of a lot of things that might be a good, you know, good costume for a pirate. And the guy who started this essentially said, well, okay, my son wants to be a pirate. He's in a wheelchair. What if we make the wheelchair the pirate ship? And so essentially they created a costume that incorporates the wheelchair. The, the, the little girl in the picture, for example, wanted to be Wonder Woman. And they, they created an invisible plane out of, uh, out, of, out of plastics and stuff. So, I, you know, off the charts, cool. And, and this is beautiful, beautiful stuff as a story. Have some tissue close by when you watch this video because, because uh, the... Now, the great big story version of this is, is, really, is really just something you will remember and share for sure. So there you go. As, as, we, as we go through November and talk about things we're grateful for, I am grateful for people who turn really cool ideas into the kinds of things that help others. So Magic Wheelchair is my, is my cool share for this week. And for anyone who's wondering, why don't we play these videos during the webinar? <laughs> we don't want to get flagged for copyright violations again. Right. Uh, we, we, have, we have had that experience. It was, it was worth not having again. <laughs> Even though we didn't mean to. We didn't mean so to. I, and they actually, you know, like flagged us for it and then let us know that, okay, you're all right. And we were like, wait, what happened? Right. And so, so all good. Let's get to another question. All right. Another question. Uh, all right. So, hoping our Michigan weather this writing writing to me. Hoping our Michigan weather this week is making it to you in the Northeast. Uh, I have a question. Do you know of a Google extension that will take a PDF and read it to special ed students who have reading deficiencies? I currently have Read and Write for Chrome, but I cannot get the PDF to save in Google so it can be read with the extension. We do not have a tech person in our school, so anything I need is a two-day search of. Any help or suggestions would be great. Thanks so much, Cinda. So I had the idea to use uh, Microsoft Edge and Immersive Reader. So in Microsoft Edge, there's a tool called Immersive Reader. Uh, and you can use Immersive Reader in a lot of places, actually. Uh, but if you open up the PDF in Microsoft Edge, Immersive Reader will read the context the content of the PDF allowed to you. Uh, you can speed it up and slow it down. You can change the voices. It'll even translate for you if you want to. Uh, so that was my suggestion. And then Rustin came along with Adobe Screen Reader User Guide, which might be helpful as well. So yes, indeed, indeed. So so found this page, uh, accessing PDF documents with assistive technology, a screen reader user's guide, which is of course, a PDF, and uh, and so follow that. They seem to have uh, plenty of info available. 
but uh, they, you know, sometimes that's actually the best place to go. It's like, this is an issue with an Adobe product. Check out Adobe. So as it turns out, they, they have something available for us. I'll get that in the chat and we will keep going. Richard. All right, uh, question from Lance, uh, one of my colleagues actually. Hmm. Um, so let me get down to the, to the, to the end of it. Um, in a remote setting, how effective is the quality if I run the videos from the software on my computer over Zoom rather than a student doing it on their own? Will students be able to view, hear my screen share videos through Zoom? I just worry about the quality of the audio video on the student end. I could have them watch the video lessons at home, but then have them remain on Zoom until they are finished. Thank you, Lance. So in Zoom, and oddly, we can't screen share Zoom while using Zoom. Uh, <laughs> in Zoom, there is an option to specify that you want to share your computer audio and not your microphone audio when you're screen sharing. And if you do that, so when you do your screen share, in your screen share options, before you hit the before you launch screen sharing, there's an option to select share computer audio. Use that option and then, oh, there it is, All right? Share computer audio, Russian just screenshotted it. Good. Right, that's right, that's Click right. That. And, and, I, and I, got, I got some of our, our group here. Oh no, that's, that was something different. So I got the share computer sound and optimize screen sharing for video clip. Yep. So uh, just to jump in real quick on that, yep. it helps. It's not making it perfect by any stretch. Uh, and yeah. And, and I don't know if this is where you were heading with it, Richard, but I, I, I just send out the link and then we re reconnect like three minutes and eight seconds later or, or, or whatever the length of yeah. the video is. Yeah. Uh, so the, the situation with Lance, because and, and I, I know Lance is one of my colleagues, I know what he's trying to do is have kids like do the exercises all together, like kind of follow along mm. uh, at the same, do them all at the same time. So that's what he's trying to get to is like they can play the video, kids can do the exercises at home or in their yard, wherever, wherever they happen to be and follow along. And so he's trying to get the best audio quality possible. That's an improvement over just letting your microphone pick up the audio that's coming out of your computer, uh, remove some of that echo, but again, not perfect. So. All right, I think, I think we've got time for one more question. All right, uh, last question. I have a health phys ed, this comes from Ellie. I have a health phys ed teacher who is looking for a tool for her students to keep a log of their daily activities, meals, calories, et cetera. Do you have a recommendation for her? She only meets with their online class once every seven days and would like them to submit their log weekly. Uh, so I had two suggestions. One, flippity.net has a progress tracker template that you can use to create a Google Sheet that will log and render a progress tracker. The other option is, is to use Google Forms. And then in Google Forms, you'll get a spreadsheet of all the student data. And you can use pivot tables in Google Form in Google Spreadsheets to show a graph or you know, tally up the data however you like and have that refresh at, as as needed. Um, I prefer using the Google Forms option. And the reason is that students can individually enter their information without seeing anybody else's information. If you use the flippity method, you have to share the whole spreadsheet with everyone and then they can see each other's data. And, you know, they, especially with health and phys ed, that gets into a whole bunch of other questions and that data does indeed. I'll, I'll add that in, in creating a form for students to fill out, uh, instead of having them write their own name, uh, create a drop down from which they, they select their name. Because otherwise, uh, you know, you know, Michael Smith might be Michael Smith one day, Mike Smith the next day, and Big Bad Daddy Mike the third day. <laughs> and so if you're trying to sort these things, it, it, it might end up being quite useful to have uh, to have made a drop down out of it. Uh, speaking of being useful to your students, take care of yourself. That's the way we can take care of our students and their learning. And so we hope you are you are getting enough sleep, getting some exercise, eating right, and 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 you're optimizing the chance that at the moment it matters for a kid, 
you can have that energy and creativity to, to do what is needed. As we mentioned earlier, maybe before we get started, I'm not, I actually can't recall. Either way, uh, I'm going to give away a free Starbucks card. We five dollar. That's it. Hey, better than getting hit, getting hit by a truck, is it not? Uh, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to say here, do this. Go to the Next Vista newsletter page, uh, and you sign up for the newsletter. If you're already on the newsletter, please go to the trouble of telling me. Actually, in the comments, that that would be useful. You're still in the drawing. Totally fine. Um, but by, by signing up, uh, you, will, you will get some, some really good info once a month. Uh, sometimes I'll toss a little bit extra out, but it'll be short. Uh, the idea is to just gather good stuff for people who, who you know, are kind of busy themselves. Uh, but I will also go through those and we'll, we'll do a random.org number pick and somebody's going to get a $5 Starbucks card because why not? So hope to see you sign up for that newsletter. Uh, there's always the, the possibility that others are like, no, no, I'll never win. And, and like one person signs up, hey, that, that's a, <laughs> that, that can happen. I have a blog at, in, uh, at Rushton H, R-U-S-H-T-O-N-H.com called Inspiring Improvement. And if you are into that space of like, yeah, I'd love to share ideas there, then, then take a look. Um, I, I don't know that I would say I post very often, but, uh, but hopefully when I do, it, it, is, it is a value written some books about getting better as a teacher in a school, and that might be of interest to you as well. Speaking of of interest, talk to us, Richard. So I have a newsletter that Maggie has subscribed to, as are some of, you, some of the rest of you. Comes out Sunday evenings or Monday mornings, depending on your time zone and or the mood of my toddlers. Uh, <laughs> but if you subscribe to it, you get a copy of the Practical EdTech Handbook 64 pages of my favorite ed tech tools, tips, techniques, strategies for teaching all kinds of cool things like search strategies. So check it out. It's free, practicaledtech.com slash weekly newsletter. Very cool that you made a, uh, a handbook that has the number of pages that is a power of two. That's purely coincidental. I don't believe that for a second. What else can you tell us about uh, the stuff that you put out there? Oh, the other stuff. So I have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it at bit.ly.com slash RMB YouTube. And I have all kinds of screencasts on how to do all kinds of things, including how to use Immersive Reader, which I just made earlier today. You can send me an email if you have a question, richard at burn.media, or follow me on Twitter. I am on Twitter. Been Excellent. Before. And... And so, so Richard M. Byrne, tell us about the M. What, what's your middle name? If, if you're willing to share it. It's Michael. All right. As it turns out, Rushton is my middle name. Ah, interesting. So fun fact, uh, I would have been the third, except for the fact that my mother put her foot down and wanted my middle name to be different than my grandfather and father. Uh, mother, mother has veto power on these things. She does. Uh, and Anne, to answer your question, Robert, so you know. All right, guys, our next, that's just not right. Uh, our next show is next week, which is the 19th. And by the time you get these slides, that'll say the right thing. So uh, I hope you got some good things out of the uh, out of the webinar today. We're gonna we're gonna wind down the recording. Uh, still answer some questions from any of the rock stars, literally, uh, in in the chat. Uh, so so we'll, we'll keep going. But those of you who've been watching the recording, thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next week.